interesting interview hacks we used early on to filter for the special driven people, the right attitude. One, rang the candidate at 8 a.m. to request for interview, early risers. Scheduled two, scheduled telephonic interviews first round at 11 p.m., late workers. Um, Got the candidates to do a detailed business case, real world thinking. Got the candidate to spend six to eight hours in the office, culture and patience. Nine, did in-person interviews at 9 p.m., long working hours. Six, regularly did Sunday interviews, extraordinary commitment. Seven, for outstation candidates, ask them to show up the next day. Hustle. Um, hmm. So I think that this has to be a meme. And if it's not a meme, then it sucks. And it shouldn't work there. You shouldn't work there. The comment, the com, the comment section is a, a little bit crude, so I will not be reading out the comments on this one. But yeah, ring them early in the morning. Not too crazy, but not nice. Uh, scheduled telephone interviews at eleven o'clock p.m. That's the that's a red flag. I wouldn't want to work for you. Um, got them to do a business case. So free work? Nope, wouldn't want to work for you. Uh, got them to spend six to eight hours in the office. Nobody needs to spend six to eight hours in the office as an interview, especially. I mean, they probably have another job. What do you want them to do? not do their other job did in-person interviews at 9 p.m maybe if you're like paying for dinner but definitely not definitely not if you're if you're just expecting me to come in for an interview maybe if we're having a good interview and we go out and have dinner you can keep me until that long but i don't know regularly did sunday interviews no what what, what kind of nonsense is this so no, I would not want to work at this company, Kristen Care. What are they? Let's see what they are. Looks like they are a, according to the website, a new age healthcare company with a laser sharp focus on simplifying the entire surgery journey of a patient and his or her attendant. By offering care and assistance at each and every step, but they don't show care and assistance towards the people that they're interviewing. Our values are to collaborate as a team and take extreme ownership of our audacious goals to achieve targets and display tremendous integrity. Wow. Including abusing your potential employees. That's really good integrity. So no, um, no, uh, these are not, this is not what a special driven person is. This is a person that's willing to be this desperate and willing to be pushed around because they need it, absolutely need a job. And this person, Harsimarbir, Harsh Singh, the co-founder at Priston Care, does not care about the people that work for them. So uh, there are some really bad and crude comments about how much people do not like that this uh, person. And I don't like them either. I'm not going to repeat them. But yeah, uh, th this is not this is not something to brag about on LinkedIn. And, I, and I, I'm really shocked that this person thinks that this is like a good thing. Like they think that, oh, my goodness, look at me. I am doing something cool. You're not. You're not. You're embarrassing. So, OK. Well, that was enough embarrassment for one episode. So we're going to stop right there. Give that LinkedIn lunatic a 10 out of 10 and then move on to the next question in the podcast. We're going to go into our college questions. First one is, how do you guys instantly know what formulas to use for a question? First year engineering student here taking physics right now. And every time I read a practical question, I can't for the life of me figure out what formula to use. Example, I'm given a question about acceleration. But acceleration has like three different formulas, and I can't tell which one I need to use. Meanwhile, my classmates only need to read the question once and immediately know what needs to be done. But I'm not sure why my mind has trouble figuring out how to get started despite reading it over and over again. Well, that's the thing. You're just reading it over and over again. You don't know how to solve problems yet. So you haven't, first of all, you probably haven't practiced enough to, to get that instinct of what to do, but you don't know how to solve problems. So the first thing that I do is even if all my variables are written out for me on the paper, I write out all my variables in all their units. And then generally looking at your equations, 
and referencing back to the practice problems you did, you might be able to then identify a form of logic of understanding which way you need to go to solve the problem. Again, I, I am actually studying for the PE exam right now, and that is the number one thing that I'm doing is familiarizing myself with my equations and doing practice problems so that that way, if I need to solve a question, I know exactly which way to go when solving that when solving that question. And it's not an exact science, but if you know the if you, if you have all your variables written out, you know, A equals, I don't know what A is, but I know what V equals. I know what X equals. I know what my position is. And I know my starting position. And I maybe maybe I know the first velocity and then the final velocity. Oh, acceleration is how I got from one velocity to another velocity. The point is, is, is whenever you write out all your variables, you'll be in a better situation with trying to solve your problems. But in addition to that, it seems like trying to understand things, your, your way of understanding things from this question is reading it over and over again. And you just need to do more practice problems and practice identifying which equations to use based on the variables you have. So write out all the variables and practice identifying the equations. And then eventually you'll know. And I'm sure that your classmates do not instantly know. They know or they're able to figure it out because they've practiced and they have identified how. So that, that's just a muscle. You're your first year engineering student, first semester, first year. That's just a muscle that you're going to need to grow. And it, it comes with practicing problems and, and learning how to study properly. So maybe find one of those friends that is consistently really good at solving those problems or it picks it up fast and, and study with them and see how they go about doing it. So yeah. And, 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 as you, and what, what I'd say is, is whenever you're doing it, looking over your example problems from your notes and stuff, they, they are picking an equation, right? So ask yourself, why did they pick that equation? Oh, because we had this, 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 and this. And, and and look at the other equations and see whether or not they would have been applicable or not. Okay, this wouldn't have been applicable because we didn't have this. So that, that's that's kind of how you study and how you learn. And, and that's just a, a muscle that you're going to grow and grow as you become an engineer. So I look forward to your journey, but you're going to figure it out. And I wish you the best of luck. Next question. Is it worth doing a dual degree of chemical engineering and chemistry? Hi, I'm going to college next year, and I was looking at chemical engineering. However, here in Spain, we don't have real job options for anything related to science and investigation or have really low salaries. Will doing a dual degree make my chances higher when going abroad? I'm planning to go somewhere like the UK. So the question is, is chemistry necessary and will it make a difference when I'm applying for a job in the future? I'm interested in vaccines, also hydrogen and even nuclear fusion. Wow, lots of really cool interests. So you say here in Spain, we don't have real job options for anything related to science and investigation, or they have really low salaries. I'll be honest, I don't know what it's like in Spain, but you said you wanted to go abroad. And I don't even know how I would go about doing this from a general level. When I pick a university in Spain, when I pick a university abroad, I don't, I, I don't know much about the universities in Spain and, and whether or not the degrees transfer, but I'll answer this from a question of chemical engineering and chemistry. I'd say that if you want to work in chemistry and you want to do stuff like vaccines and hydrogen and nuclear fusion, that sounds like you're going to be doing research and you're probably going to have to go on to grad school to go that route um, and become like a, a doctorate in chemistry. So there's a little bit of school ahead of you for that. And if you're interested in doing that, then I think you could you could definitely get a, your PhD in chemistry and, and have a great career doing that. And you can do stuff in sciences. And I don't know which countries to go to. I'd say that in the U.S., a decent bit of people come to the U.S. for their education, and then they'll get their graduate degrees in the U.S., and then they'll get their visas to stay in the U.S., and, and that's, that's, that's one path. I can't really speak to the U.K., what I will say, though, is if you're interested in chemical engineering and you want to do chemical engineering, do you need to get the, the dual degree with chemistry? I don't think so. If you want to do chemical engineering, I do not think you also need a chemistry undergrad double major degree. It's, it's just not relevant. Well, it's relevant, but it's not required because if you're going to get a chemical engineering degree, you're going to take a lot of the basic chemistry courses, and then you're going to take upper level chemical engineering uh, electives. So 
you you have a decent foundation in chemistry already from the chemical engineering degree and and that chemistry degree you don't really need it to work as a chemical engineer would it would it help sure i think it would help to the extent that it helps you understand chemistry and be a better chemical engineer but it won't necessarily help you get more jobs the the chemical engineering company wants to hire you because you have a hire you for as being a chemical engineer because you have a degree in chemical engineering so that's a that's a difficult question uh, and there's a lot there i say that you know hydrogen nuclear fusion you can work for the there's a lot of companies like I don't know about the nuclear side, but I know that you have Mitsubishi. It's pretty big in the hydrogen space. There's a lot of, uh, uh, we call them OEMs in the in the nuclear hydrogen for world that you can work for. Uh, I, I try to look at who those OEMs are and, and see where they're located and where they hire people and, and maybe kind of look at that whenever you're trying to look at where to work after graduation. And then maybe also go on LinkedIn and look up people that work for those companies that work in chemistry related roles and see, okay, do they have engineering degrees? Do they have chemistry degrees? Do they have doctorates in chemistry. And then you can kind of get a better picture of, of what people that are doing what you want to do have as an educational background. That's, that's kind of the way I'd go about seeing it. So, um, yeah, lots of lot, lots to unpack there, but is it worth doing a dual degree of chemical engineering and chemistry from a general perspective? I'd say no. I think it's one or the other. And if I were picking one or the other, I'd pick chemical engineering just because I'm an engineer. And I think that the chemical engineering route is a good way to go without having to go to grad school. Um, but then either way, you still could end up going to grad school, get your master's in chemical engineering. You know, another thing that I know people that do this is they people get undergraduate degrees. I know somebody that's doing this right now, actually, that has that she has an undergraduate degree in chemistry, and now she's getting her master's in chemical engineering. That is another way to go. And I have to ask her if she if she is happy about that, that she had the chemistry background or if she wishes she had the chemical engineering background first. I'll have to. I will ask her and I'll report back on the next episode of the podcast. But what I'd say is it, <laughs> I do see a lot of people going from chemistry undergrads to chemical engineering masters, and they have to do a little bit of makeup work, a little bit of basic stuff to kind of get caught up and then get them, uh, the, you know, prerequisites to get into chemical engineering master's programs. Um, but I mean, you can go that route as well. So yeah, lots of lots of rambling there. I'm sorry about that. But I think that there's, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack here. And there's it's definitely a good question. Um, and I think there's just multiple things you have to take into consideration. So I hope that you listen to what I had to say, and you you take these things into consideration whenever you're trying to make your decision. But I would go chemical engineering. And then if you wanted to go work for an OEM, you could either work there with your chemical engineering degree or get a master's in chemical engineering to do that. I think that most of the things that you want to do with chemistry, uh, you can get there most of the companies that you describe that you want to work for, you can start working for them with a chemical engineering degree. So, all right. Next question. Mechanical engineering, or chemical engineering. All right. I just got accepted at university in Houston at a university in Houston. So university of Houston, Rice University. There's a lot of universities in Houston, but okay. Which one should I choose? Mechanical engineering or chemical engineering? I've been taking several science courses and doing great on all of them. Good for you. I used to tutor Gen Chem and O Chem FYI. Okay, so you probably are already a sophomore or maybe, wait, you just got accepted at a university in Houston and you also tutored O Chem. So did you take O Chem in high school? Wow, okay, smart. All right, I like math and a lot and then physics and then chemistry. I thought mechanical engineering would be a good choice. I want to do a master's in science and aerospace, but given that I live in Houston, chemical engineering would give me lots of job opportunities. Please help me decide. I'd say that yes, chemical engineering would give you lots of job opportunities and generally process engineers that work for those consulting firms or the or the different uh we call them owners or big you know all the you know Exxons, the Valeros, the shells of the world in Houston. Uh, the, the, the process engineers, the chemical engineers probably make a little bit more than the mechanical engineers, but you can still work for them as a mechanical engineer. What I'd say is, is you're going to make a lot more money doing what you enjoy. And you also said you want to do a master's in science and aerospace. So if you actually want to go that right route, which you don't have to, to work as in aerospace, by the way, you don't have to 
you don't have to have a master's in aerospace to work in aerospace, but you can work in aerospace with a mechanical engineering degree, probably with a chemical engineering degree, probably not as many chemical engineers that work for aerospace companies in the aerospace part, but hey, they have to do stuff with fuel, right? So there's probably some chemical engineers that work for aerospace companies. I am not an expert in aerospace companies. But yeah, I, what I'd say is whichever you prefer, you're going to do better at. So if you like physics more and you like, you're you're going to have to take entry level courses anyways. So you're probably going to have to take statics regardless. And if you really like your statics course or your dynamics course, then I would go mechanical. And if you really don't enjoy statics and mechanics, then that might be the sign that it's time for you to go a different route to go chemical. If you really, really like chemistry and OCHEM, then then chemical might be the way to go. But I mean, I chose mechanical because I liked statics. I liked dynamics. I liked I mean, I liked my mechanics and materials class. And I just liked I generally liked all the classes I was taking that were pointing me in the direction of mechanical engineering. And for the longest time, I was trying to decide between mechanical and electrical. And I, I made the choice because I just liked the mechanical stuff more. So what I'd say is I wouldn't make this decision entirely on money. Your success is related is going to be related to how you perform and how you perform is going to be related to how much you enjoy doing what you do. So what I would say is pick the one you enjoy the most. And you're going to you're going both of them are going to lead to careers where you can make good money and just roll with it. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of questions there, a lot of, a lot of different statements there. If you want to go in aerospace, mechanical, but in general, pick whatever is more related to what you're interested in. And it sounds like it's mechanical and I, I wouldn't make the decision. It sounds like you also are good at chemistry. So I get it. I get the, the wanting to go the chemical route. But if you're more passionate about aerospace and you want to work in that direction, then then I go mechanical. So. Follow your passion is what I'd say. All right. Well, that was college questions. Let's take a quick break and we will be right back with career questions. All right. And we're back. First question. First job. Is it normal to feel totally incompetent two months into my first plant process engineering job? The onboarding was not structured at all and I got projects as soon as I arrived. I find myself struggling a lot and spending more time than needed on seemingly small tasks because I'm I need to learn a lot to do them. Yes, it is. It, I, I'd say that it takes about six months to really get into a groove with your new role and plus or minus based on just personal circumstances and in company circumstances. So yes, it is normal to feel totally incompetent two months into your first pro plant process engineering job. What I'd say is, is that hopefully at this point you're starting to pick up things here and there, but it's not on you if it's taking you time to figure things out. It's not, it says that there was no on structured onboarding. That's on them. And they gave you projects as soon as you arrived. That's on them, but also good for you because I mean, they did hire you in for your first job as an entry level employee. So they should understand that you might not know how to do everything, but the fact that they gave you plant projects right away and they're letting you kind of try to figure things out. I hope that's a good thing. I hope that's a sign of them trusting that th these are things that you can figure out and you can do. And, and what I'd say is, is don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't ask the same question more than once. So take good notes and, and give your best effort on those things and you should be fine. But yes, it is totally normal for you to feel semi to totally incompetent in your first months, two months in. And then also there's probably a little bit of an imposter syndrome going on there as well. So yeah, there's just, it, it, it's normal to feel the way that you feel. What I'd say is give it your best and find a mentor or find somebody that has been doing this for a little bit longer than you, maybe another plant engineer that, that is experienced and, and, and try to ask them questions and hopefully Eventually, you'll start picking things up uh, because you've been taking good notes and asking good questions and and doing things, and and then you'll get into a groove with doing what you're doing. But there there should be somebody that you should roll up, you can roll up to, and and they should know that you, it's your first job out of school, 
And they really shouldn't expect you to be extremely knowledgeable about everything because it's your first job out of school. So yes, it is totally normal for you to feel kind of incompetent at this stage. All right, next question. Can I take a month vacation between an internship and being hired full time? I've been working a three month summer internship at a civil engineering firm, and they said they want to bring me on full time at the end of my internship. I was planning to stay stay with my girlfriend in Europe for a month at the end of the internship before joining the company full time. Would they be okay with this? I'm afraid to ask them. Yes. What I'd say is this is awesome that they offered you an internship, but it sounds like you're maybe a. I don't know what your employment status is. But if you are transitioning from being entered to being maybe maybe you're part time, I don't know if you're part time or full time, but if you're part time right now and they want to bring you on full time, then there's a natural gap there. Maybe they were ROFing you, uh, reduction of forcing you after your internship and there, there'll be a gap there. So, yes, it, it is perfectly OK to, to ask for that. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like you probably graduated in May and you submitted this in June, so you're working at the internship over the summer, and then they asked if you uh, would come on full time afterwards. I mean, that's the whole point of the internship is to get brought on afterwards. So good job on you. Uh, but yes, it is completely natural for somebody to want to take a break before starting their first job full time. So if I were you, I'd say, yeah, hey, thanks so much for uh, for offering me this program, this this full time job. Let's talk about the details. And by the way, my start date is going to be, I need my start date to be a bit blank because I've scheduled a, a vacation for the end of this internship because this internship had an end date, right? So you could just say, hey, because this internship had an end date, I scheduled a vacation from this day to this day. So I would like my first time, first day as a full-time employee to be Y date. And, and that's perfectly fine. I... I graduated in May and my first day at work was in July because I also scheduled a month long vacation through Europe for the month of June. So not fully a month, but a, a decent vacation in Europe for the month of June. So yes, this is before you start your first full time job. This is one of the best times to take an extended vacation. So muscle up, ask the question. It is normal to want to take a vacation before you start your first full time job. Next one. My partner recently graduated, but nobody wants to hire her, and I'm worried it's because of her GPA. I'm writing this for my partner, 23 female, because she's applied to about 70 jobs now with no luck so far. She had an awful final year thanks to a lot of mental issues crashing down on her at the worst possible time and managed to graduate with a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a 2.9 GPA. How badly does this matter? I understand this field has a lot of people with a high GPA, and a lot of companies are looking for that, so I'm worried that a lot of companies are writing her off because of that. Is there anything she can do or any advice I can relate to her? She's struggling a lot with this, and I can see her getting more and more depressed about this. I'm sorry that if this is not the place to ask this, but I also feel very helpless as her partner. I'm already on the lookout for job listings and sending those to her whenever I see one, so I'm doing everything I can. Good. Some general info. She's looking for a job in process engineering. She's making a cover letter for each job. She has no real experience other than working in a lab for a month as an internship. She has been working in a lab during her study, but it's not really related to chemical engineering that much. She lives in Texas, but is willing to relocate to nearby states. So what I'm trying to ask is, do you guys know of anything she can do? How badly does her GPA matter when job hunting? And if her GPA really matters, what can she still do to stay relevant in relation to the other potential candidates? Thank you for reading this. I'm just trying to help her any way I can think of. Well, what I do is I'd have her send her resume into R slash engineering resumes and have her review her resume. I'd also leave her GPA off of her resume. Now, 2.9 is actually, I see that 3.0 is like generally the, the like, oh, 3.0 GPA and above. Nobody really blinks at it. 2.9, it's really close to that. And there's a story there. Everybody has personal circumstances. It sounds like she had a personal circumstance. So it's not really the worst thing ever. But yeah, I would just leave it off the resume. Um, it does seem like she she said she has no uh, no real experience other than working in a lab for a month as an internship. Okay, so she does have experience. That needs to be experience line item number one on her resume, and she needs to sell it as best as she can because she worked in a lab, so that's an internship. That's not research, so that's good. That's going to help her translate to a job. And then also, she said she had been working in a lab during her study, but it's not really related to chemical engineering much. I don't care. Put that on her resume too and put as many bullet points on that resume as she can that are related to that. And this is the feedback that she's going to get on r slash engineering resumes. As for your question, is there any advice that you can give her? No. Other than, hey, 
seek out these communities that are awesome on Reddit to help engineers get jobs. I'd say that y you being as involved as you are is good because you want to help, but trying to give her advice, especially if you're not an engineer, it's, it's just not it's not probably the where she wants to hear the advice from. Uh, and as much as you love her and as much as you care about her, it's just probably not the place she wants to hear the, the advice from. So what I'd say is tell her to keep on applying because 70 applications is not that many. I I'd say 10 a day minimum applications. And and also what she should be doing is reaching out to the lab that she interned at and talking to engineers that work there and engineers that, that have worked there before that now maybe work for other companies and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. Can you help find, help me? Do you know anybody that's hiring entry level engineers? Combining that online just shotgun firing resume after resume after resume after resume with the addition of networking into personal connections, that will increase her chances of getting a job. I think that you are right that her resume currently the way that you've described it doesn't really stand out like it's not the first resume i'd pick up off of a pile if i had some other resumes where people had more internship experience or more work experience or a better gpa or they were more involved in certain clubs her resume wouldn't be the first one i grab but somebody that knows her and knows her work ethic and knows how how she showed up every day at work and or how she showed up every day in a lab People that actually know this about her can then say these things that she they like about her to their friends that are hiring entry level engineers and they can get her job. And what I'd say is, I mean, chemical engineering, if I'm if I'm her, I am rapid firing my resume as much as I possibly can in Dallas and Houston, mainly Houston. That's where all the big chemical engineering firms are, all the big engineering consulting firms. She needs to go on the ENR website and look up the top engineering consulting firms and then find the top 50 and apply to all of them, all of their offices in Dallas and Houston. And, and I'm sure she'll be able to find a job in Texas. Um, she lives in Texas, but is willing to relocate to nearby States. Are you willing to relocate to nearby States? Interesting. But yeah, I, what I'd say is send her this video and then and then tell her to check out r slash engineering resumes and also just start applying for jobs in Houston, uh, leave her GPA off and really jazz up that resume to make those experiences look sexy. And then also talk to the people that she worked with at those companies and help see if they have any connections and network that they can also network her into. I'd also say that depending on what university she went to, maybe she could also talk to the department chair and say, hey, I don't have a job yet. Can you help me find a job? Because engineering engineering schools are graded on how do, good, good, a jo, good a job they do of placing their graduates. And your department chair might have connections in the industry with alumni. They might have professors in the in their faculty that have connections with alumni. Just just getting that personal touch and getting one step further along in the process than sending a resume through Indeed or Monster Jobs or LinkedIn will also really increase her chances. So, but that's just general job searching advice. So, all right, next question, two more to go. My firm is asking me to relocate. The company I'm working for is doing site civil engineering and they're asking me to relocate to another office. I'm about two years into my career and don't yet have my PE. I really don't wanna move and have voiced this to the firm. They told me the new city will offer me a lot more opportunity and I don't see it being worth the price of picking up my entire life. Any advice on how to navigate this situation is appreciated. Wow. I'm trying to burp. Any advice on how to navigate this situation is appreciated. All right. If you don't want to move, you can just say no. Um, especially if all they're dangling in front of you is the new city will offer you a lot more opportunity. I would definitely not move unless they've talked about reimburse paying for your travel, paying for your relocation, giving you a relocation bonus potentially, and then also giving you a promotion along with that. Though what I'd also be doing is if you say no, I do not want to move, they might also be indicating that they might be closing down the office that you're in. 
not, not, I'm not saying that they're doing that. Um, but it sounds like that maybe isn't where the center of their business is, is where you're currently officed. So what I would say is, is also the minute that you say, no, I'm not going to relocate. You need to have already been applying to other jobs and starting to interview for other jobs in your city. To some people, this city that you live in is really important. It sounds like that's the case to you. And I respect that. And I, I think that's perfectly fine. What I will say though, is as somebody who's relocated twice for work in the last two years, I'm really glad that I did. And the reason why I'm glad that I did is because first of all, these relocations came with promotions. I was offered promotions to relocate twice in two years. So relocating, I was able to leverage my relocations into promotions. I was able to leverage my relocations into salary increases. And, and that's what, that's one of the benefits of relocating. Also, I got to live in a new city and I got to discover new cities. Like I got to, I got to say that I lived in New Orleans for a year, one of the most iconic cities in the entire world. I got to live there for a year. And now your relocation is, sounds like it's a little bit different. It sounds like they want to move you, you somewhere permanently. And that's kind of what my company did when they moved me to Charlotte. It's semi-permanent. It's generally permanent. I mean, potentially I'd go back to Texas, but for the time being, we're in Charlotte and we really don't have any plans of leaving anytime soon because Maddie's in grad school here. But yeah, I, I am so glad that I moved to Charlotte. I mean, I, I miss my friends. I miss all my friends in Texas, but man, it is so cool. Charlotte is such a cool city. It is literally physically cool. It is 75 degrees outside. The people in our neighborhood are nice. I get to live in a new environment. We get to go see the leaves turn green and go to the Smoky Mountains and go through the Appalachians. And it, I mean, th this is this is really cool. And I'm so glad that I have the opportunity to live in a new place. So what I'd say is that there are pros to moving, but if you don't want to move, you don't want to move. But if you're not going to move, start sprucing up that resume and start applying for other jobs. So wish you the best of luck with your situation. All right, last questions. What to do if I can't afford to pay up front to go on a company trip? Company is asking us to meet up at our headquarters in Colorado, and they want employees to pay for a hotel and flight up front. This is also a week-long trip. I've looked at the rates, and just for the hotel, I'd be spending $700, which is almost half of my paycheck. If I pay this, I'd be other behind on other expenses and bills, plus my credit cards that I have don't have high enough limits. Also, I don't want to go on this trip as I had a bad experience at the last meetup, plus it's the summertime. People want to go on trips with families and friends. What should I do? Just say no that I won't be able to go. Edit, yes, I'll get reimbursed, but I still need to expense things today, not two weeks, two weeks after this trip. Just don't go. It's just a weird. It's weird that they want you to cash flow their business. I, what I'd, first of all, I, I would have a higher credit card limit than seven hundred dollars. And I mean, and if if, they're, if they've shown that they're good for reimbursing it, then yeah, I, I would probably do it and say thanks for the cash back points. But that's just me on a personal level. But you seem obviously uncomfortable with it. And it's going to sounds like because you're uncomfortable with it and because of your way that your credit card limits work on your credit cards, it's just not comfortable for you in general. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't go say, hey, I'm not in a position to pay up front for this trip. And they know how much money you make. They're your employer. So they know that this is a big, a big deal for you. And they should be cognizant of that. And they should probably have either a per diem system or just book your trips and travel for you, they should have a better system of doing this. And because they don't have a better system of doing this, it's impacting you. So if you can't go, just don't go. I, uh, that's just so weird. I mean, it's just so weird to me that they are that way, but I, I would also get a credit card with a higher limit. Um, but how I'd actually handle it is what I'd say, Hey boss, I can't pay up in front. So either you can book it for me or I can't come. And that's a pretty easy conversation to have with your boss. So they they really should be having a, a corporate card. But if if they're not gonna if they're not going to be able to accommodate you and it's gonna unfairly burden you financially, just don't go. 
All right. Well, you have spent another perfectly good 40 minutes hanging out with me on this episode of the Engineering Success Podcast. Thank you, guys. Uh, keep your eye out. We have I will be appearing on another podcast, Soft as Steel. I will be doing, I did an interview for them last week, and I will be getting published on their podcast website in December. I will put a link to their podcast out on my socials. If you like the podcast, please make sure to share it with your friends. The best way to help the show grow is if you're watching a video format to comment down below or just to share it with people you like. And what else? Um, oh, also, and again, I mentioned earlier that I'm taking the PE exam. So I also will be documenting my process of preparing for the PE exam on all my socials as well. So make sure to follow in with that. But this has been Engineering Success, a little bit of a scatterbrain of an episode, but I hope that you enjoyed it and found it entertaining. If you agree with me, let me know. If you disagree with me, let me know. But as always, I am Daniel. This has been Engineering Success, and I will catch up with you next week. Thanks.